Chapter two is your basic chemistry, where you're going to talk about bonding, covalent versus non-covalent, uh, ionic, and hydrogen bonds. This, again, should be all reviewed from your chemistry class. So let's first review covalent bonds. Atoms that don't have full outer shells may want to share electrons so that they can both have full outer shells. This is the basic definition of a covalent bond. And again, you should know what an energy level is and shells when we talk about electron placement around an atom. For your homework, what I want you to do is I want you to define electronegativity, which is again a basic chemistry vocab term you should remember from your, your chemistry class. And question number two is how does this affect bonding? So if we look at a simple hydrogen atom, you know that it has one proton, therefore it has one electron to neutralize the charge. And with only having one electron in that outermost energy level, it's not stable. In order for hydrogen to get stable, it needs to look like helium or have a helium, helium electron configuration, which has two electrons in that first orbital. So by sharing the one outer electron that it has out here with the other hydrogen atom, so we're shared here, they each now look like helium with two electrons in their outermost shells, so that makes them stable. They have obtained that noble gas configuration with their electrons. You need to familiarize yourself with a molecule of water because we are going to be talking about water for some time now. It is one atom of oxygen surrounded by two atoms of hydrogen. Now, if we look at the oxygen atom, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. So you know if it has eight electrons, you should be able to tell me how many protons it would have. Of course, it would have eight protons. Now, if we look at the way the electrons are organized, which you should know from chemistry, it only has six in the, so one, two, three, four, five, six, in its outermost energy level. The first energy level only holds two electrons. It's full, so we had to move to the second energy level. But now we're not full. We have two additional electrons that we can add to that second energy shell. So by sharing an electron with hydrogen, here we get our seventh, and over here we get eight, which means we have met octet, which is another chemistry term. When atoms have met octet, that means, again, they've reached that noble gas configuration. Noble gases, with the exception of helium, all have eight electrons in that outermost electron orbital, which means they're full and they're stable. So by having two hydrogen atoms sharing electrons with it, with the um, oxygen atom right here and here, we've created two covalent bonds. So we'll have a covalent bond here and a covalent bond here. And this is a very special type of covalent bond, which we'll get to a little bit later. Well, I guess it is a little bit later. So let's talk about that special type of covalent bond I had just mentioned in water. So we have our water molecule over here. So we have our water. And as we were talking about, um, there's two types of covalent bonds. So of course we are sharing here and here with the water molecule. We also have a different molecule over here called methane. Now methane is a carbon atom surrounded by four hydrogen atoms. And it is also sharing um, electrons. We have four bonds, covalent bonds over here. But if you remember that term electronegativity that we had discussed earlier and you were supposed to look up as part of your homework assignment, when you have atoms that have equal or similar electronegativity values, we call those nonpolar. And that means that they are sharing those electrons nicely within each other. But there are some situations, especially when they're on opposite sides of the periodic table, 
where we see they have big discrepancies in their electronegativity. Oxygen is one of them. Oxygen is very greedy and would love to take two electrons from any other atom so that it can be complete. It can meet octet. Fluorine is even worse. As we get closer to those noble gases, that group 7 only needs one electron, so they're highly electronegative. Of course, oxygen is in group 6, so it's not as electronegative as fluorine, but it is much more electronegative than hydrogen. So what happens is, is the oxygen here will kind of hold that electron closer to itself. It's sharing, but it's holding it closer. And because it's holding it closer, that part of the molecule becomes partially negative. The other end, because it's not holding its electron now close enough towards it, tends to become a little bit more positive. So we have what's called a partial positive and a partial negative charge, which sets up what we call a polar molecule. It's not ionic. It didn't completely take that electron away from hydrogen. But again, it's not sharing it equally. Now, ionic bonds, this is where we have such a greater difference in electronegativity that we actually pull off an electron. This is how we form sodium chloride. So ions, these are charged atoms. After they've lost or gained an electron, they now become charged. So we refer to a charged atom as an ion. Ionic compounds are ions that are electrostatically attracted to each other. So for example, if we have sodium that will only has one electron in that outer orbital, so if it loses, it becomes positively charged. Chlorine is, again, in that group 7, so it wants just one electron. It's very highly electronegative. It, it'll rip off that electron from sodium, but sodium really doesn't care too much because it really wants to get rid of it. But now they both have met the the electron configuration of a noble gas, but they have this charge associated with themselves. They're ions. We have a positive and a negative ion. If they were to hang out together, though, they would neutralize their charges. So they're kind of like magnets stuck together. You can pull a magnet apart, all right, just like you can pull ions apart. They're just attracted to one another because of the opposite charges. So here's just a picture of our sodium chloride. So here is our one electron that's out here by itself and how chlorine needs just one electron to, again, for both of them here to meet their electron configuration of a noble gas to meet octet. So by transferring it over, sodium's met octet, chlorine's met octet, but they have that charge. So by the two of them hanging out together, we can neutralize that charge and this is called an ionic compound. So we can see here how we will alternate between sodium chloride in order to keep from having two positives or two negatives together. Kind of like when you get two magnets of the same polarity, you know that they repel each other. That's the same with positives and negatives. So they're going to space themselves in such a way that they um, are not pushing away from each other. Once they've done this, this particular structure is referred to as a crystalline lattice. Now let's talk about hydrogen bonds. So when we have water in solution, so what we're basically saying is aqueous water. H2O was one of those weird compounds that we have um, a specific name for it in each phase. If you think about it in chemistry, you would designate whether it was a solid, liquid, or gas for most of your compounds. But here with water, we're saying that the solid form of water is called ice, the liquid is water, and the gas is steam. So it kind of sounds weird when we say liquid water. But in this case, we are talking about um, H2O as a liquid. And what happens is because of those polar covalent bonds, you have, remember, one part of the molecule that has that partial positive charge and the other end that has a partial negative. So what happens is those molecules are going to try to orient themselves so that you don't have two positive ends by each other or two negatives. And that interaction, that attraction between the negative and, and positive um, ends of the water molecules are called hydrogen bonds. So here you can see the actual molecules lining up. 
so that, again, we don't have two partial positive ends of the molecules together or two partial negatives. And we generally represent hydrogen bonds as these dashed lines. So we've been talking about water for a while, but why is water so special? It's polar, and that polar type of bond allows for adhesion, cohesion, high heat capacity, high heat of vaporization, and high surface tension. So let's talk about those characteristics of water. Now looking at water in a biological point of view, why is water important to life? We know that 71% of the Earth's surface has water on it. 66% of the weight of a human body is water weight. It is important because we need water in order to um, generate many cellular reactions to break down food and it is very important as a solvent. So many of those chemical reactions that take place are taking place inside of water. They're dissolved in water. So we have a lot of hydrogen bonds with polar and charged molecules. So we're going to be going back to that chemistry when we talk about life and all the chemical reactions required in order to sustain life. So let's first talk about water as a solvent. Many of you guys know that sugar and salt dissolve in water, but you may not understand the actual chemistry behind that. Now, we have been talking about sodium chloride, and we know that sodium chloride, which is sitting down here, is held together by ionic bonds, by positive and negative ions being attracted to one another. But now, when water is involved. Remember water has that partial positive and partial negative charge also. So over here we have that partial negative on the hydrogen side we'll have the partial positive. So when we mix the two together, I always talk about ionic molecules as being promiscuous. They really don't care who their partner is as long as it's of the opposite charge. So in this case, they're going to leave, they're dumping their partners here and they're going off with water. And notice the particular ends of the water that they're going off on. We have the sodium, which is the, the smaller ion, which is the positive end. The positive ion is going to hang out with the negative end of the, of the water molecule. Versus over here, we have the negative ion here, which is going to go over here and hang out with the positive into the water molecule. And this will continue as long as you have enough sites on the water to take a partner here of the opposite charge. But once we fill all those water sites with ions, we can't dissolve things any further. And you may realize this when you put too much of your Nestle Quick inside your milk. You get that sludge at the bottom of your glass because it's a saturated solution. As much as you want to dissolve that into the milk, it will only hold so much of that chocolate solution. Milk is mostly water. So we have the water and then we have that ionic solution, that mixture, the powder that we're trying to dissolve inside of that. Same with sugar. When you put too much sugar in your coffee or you are trying to put more and more salt into water to gargle. So there is a particular amount of solute that you can put inside water. Once those sites are full, it can't hold it any longer. So another important property of water, and it has to do with, again, this hydrogen bonding, is that ice, you know ice is less dense than water. Ice floats. If you look at the picture over here, you can see how when we start to remove energy from water, the molecules start to slow down to the point where they are no longer exchanging position. I do not want to say they're not moving anymore because that would assume we're at absolute zero because even though solids are not exchanging position, they are vibrating in their space. I always refer to like students when you guys are sitting in your desk, you're not moving around the classroom, but you are kind of moving in your seat. You're breathing, you're fidgeting, you're moving your, your pencil or chewing gum or something like that in your location, but you're not moving position with your neighbors. And that's generally the definition of a solid. But again, because water has that partial positive and negative end of the molecule, we want to make sure we don't get two positive ends together or two negatives. So it will slowly, as the energy is withdrawn and it starts to get into its crystalline lattice 
structure, it will line up to maximize the number of hydrogen bonds because then we have negatives and positives facing each other. They don't lengthen or shorten, they maximize. We have more hydrogen bonds. And in order to do that, you have to spread out the molecules. And when you spread out the molecules, they become less dense. Versus down here, we have water, liquid water, and we have the atoms are moving around, and so we are constantly making and breaking hydrogen bonds, but they're only next to each other. If there's a positive next to a positive, it's just momentarily as they're moving by one another. So we can get more water molecules in a given space, so the density is higher. So for Homer, I want you to think about this. I want you to, again, I want you to explain why ice is less dense than water. So you have to review the idea of density, you know, how many atoms in a given space. And then question four is, how is this important for aquatic life? Why is it important that ice floats? Another important property of water is specific heat. It requires a lot of energy to convert liquid water to a gas. If you were to put a droplet of water on your table versus a droplet of like uh, ethyl alcohol, which is like rubbing alcohol, you'll see that rubbing alcohol will evaporate quickly. Water will evaporate slowly over time. It just it takes a lot more energy to convert it from a liquid to a gas, which is which is very important, and we'll talk about that property with life. Cohesive and surface tension, again, because you have those hydrogen bonds taking place, they will tend to bead up and adhere to one another. Another important property of water is its definition. We tend to define things whether it's hydrophobic or hydrophilic. That's how important water is to living things because living organisms use water as their solvent inside their cells. If things will dissolve, if substances will dissolve in water, we call them hydrophilic, they're water loving, versus if they will not dissolve in water, they are hydrophobic, they're water fearing. So this kind of goes back to like oil and water doesn't mix, which is what this picture is trying to show you. So water we know is going to be hydrophilic, it loves itself, right? So it will be a polar substance, and then the oil down here will be nonpolar. We always also like to say that likes dissolve likes. So polar will dissolve polar, nonpolar will dissolve nonpolar, but polar will not dissolve nonpolar. They are not the same. One's hydrophobic, one's hydrophilic. So they are they do not go together. The last topic in chapter two are acids and bases. You should know your common acids like vinegar and a common base. Many of us don't use lye anymore. Lye used to be used kind of like bleach back before we commonly use bleach. Some of you may have used lye to make soap. Um, the definition of an acid is a substance that yields hydrogen ions in solution. So for exa example, hydrochloric acid is HCl. We know it gives off that hydrogen. The definition of a base is a substance that accepts hydrogen ions. So here's sodium hydroxide. We put that in water. It will give off the OH, which is the hydroxide group. So here's our example of our acids and bases. This particular slide is just showing acids and it's showing you how when you pour the acid, hydrochloric acid, into the water that the H plus and Cl negative, the two ions will disassociate. And I kind of talked about how when we have opposite ions, how they, they will snuggle up with the opposite ends of the water so we will get them being taken in by water. Now a particular term when water takes in a proton here, H plus ion, it forms H3O positive, kind of like a water ion, and that particular ion is referred to as a hydronium ion. So you may see that because we generally won't see this in solution, we'll see this. So you could say that an acid will increase the amount of H plus or increase the amount of hydronium ions. Either one is acceptable.
Now with our base, we're showing that just the opposite's happening here. We actually have um, the sodium ion coming apart from, disassociating from the hydroxide, the OH negative ion. And generally what will happen then is we will get an increase in, like I said, the hydroxide ion, and that's the base. So what happens to your pH is it gets bigger. It gets higher than 7. Now if we were to take both your acid and your base and put them together, then what happens is like this here, this this positive ion will come together with this negative ion and it will form water. And it's neutralized. And then of course what happens to the sodium and the chlorine? Well, we know what happens when we get sodium chloride together. It forms a salt. So you take two very strong acid, an acid, hydrochloric acid, and a base, sodium hydroxide, and mix them together, and you neutralize it and make salt water. So when we talk about the pH scale, it is logarithmic, which means it goes up by a factor of 10. And it's all also kind of like an inverse relationship. So as we see here, as the concentration of H plus goes up, all right, the number gets smaller. So it does increase, and it's showing you here with the red dots being the high, the H pluses, and then the blue dots being the OH negative. So as the acid gets stronger, we have more and more H pluses. As it becomes more basic, we have less and less. And you see, we have less red balls down at this end. Again, they are stipulating the the red is your H plus, and I don't think I have blue. Let's see. Yep, yep. Here, the blue is OH negative. So that's what those little spheres are representing. So as we go down towards here, we have a higher concentration of hydroxide ions. And you can see here the comparison with bleach and lye and ammonia. So for neutral, that would be where you have equal amounts, and that's where water would sit. This is really important when we talk about pH and health. This can be seen like with asthma, cardiac arrest, vomiting is a result of acidosis, which means that the pH of the blood is not where it needs to be, it's too acidic. Um, we also know about pH in the environment with acid rain and what it's doing to our environment. Um, I do want you to also, for your homework assignment, you will be looking at the term buffering. So you have seven homework questions, questions one through seven, that are due by August 7th. So just write those questions down and then the answers and email me your responses and I will email you back your um, graded work. Also, um, questions, answers to questions may be found on the website with the modules. You'll notice there are many movies for you to watch on there in your textbook or simply go and do an internet search, which many of you should be in the habit of doing by now. So again, questions one through seven are due. The, the latest of August 7th, you can always turn them in earlier. But I do forewarn you about working too early this during the summer because I don't want you to forget this information when you get back to school in August.